meeting and they went and had the board of commissioners called the order compliant with the Open Public Meetings Act of the state of New Jersey. Adequate notice of this meeting of the Atlanta County Board of Commissioners was provided in the following manner. Published in the press of Atlantic City and mailed to the current, the Daily Journal, the Hamilton Gazette, and the Hamilton News. And has been posted on the bulletin boards in the county office building in Atlantic City. Stillwater Building in Northfield and the County Clerk's Office in Mays Landing. Uh, as we kick off today's meeting with a prayer, I'd ask that we keep in our thoughts and prayers those impacted by mental health illness. The tragic passing of Naomi Judd uh, this past weekend is a reminder that mental health does not discriminate in who it impacts. One in five adults and one in six children aged 6 to 17 in the U.S. experience mental health each year. Uh, also, May is also Brain Cancer Awareness Month. Brain cancer represents 26% of all childhood cancer cases. It kills more children than any other cancer. Our thoughts and prayers to those impacted by these horrific diseases. Heavenly Father, guide us that we may be productive leaders of our community. Lord, please direct our actions and decisions for the service of others. Amen. 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 And face the flag. Attention, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioner Ballas is on his way. He's in traffic. Bertino? Here. Forsey? Present. Days? Here. Fitzpatrick? Here. Gatto? Here. Parker? Here. Risley? Here. And Kern? Here. We'll be all happy for these girls when they're done now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, soon enough. It's going to be a while. It will be a while. All security. Uh, the commission has had an opportunity to review the minutes from April 19, 2022. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the April 19, 2022 minutes as Second. Motion made. Second, we'll have a roll call. Bertino? Yes. Horsey? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, anyone that would like to speak during public comments this evening, please come to the podium, state your name, the town you reside. You'll be provided up to three minutes to speak. If you're attending virtually, please type yes and the resolution number in the question and answer box. Any items not listed on the agenda, you may speak during the public comment section. Uh, you will be raised from an attendee to a panelist. When you're raised, again, please state your name and the town that you reside. And again, that, that's three minutes and that's just to accommodate everybody to make sure you have time to speak. Okay. So now uh, it's a pleasure to have Kara with us this evening, uh, timely as well. Uh, since yes. the new ban on plastic and paper bags in New Jersey begins tomorrow, May 4th. It will be an adjustment for all of us and will of course be a transition. But in the long run, we only need to look at the ever increasing climate events to know we need to act now to make a difference for the future of our children. And I'll just step right up, Kara. It was our acting public health division director. Good evening, um, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm Kara Jansen. I'm Atlanta County's acting public health division director. I want to thank you for having me here today. Um, to give you information on how Atlanta County Health Department um, what role we have in the ban for New Jersey's carry-out bags and styrofoam. Don't forget that. So polystyrene foam food service products, which I'll just refer to as styrofoam. Um, I also have Kathy Meisel here. She is the Atlantic County Environmental Health Coordinator. And if you have any technical questions, she can answer. So as you said, uh, you know, given the estimates of waste, volumes, environmental damage attributed to single-use plastic bags and to the foam products. The state of New Jersey passed um, Public Law 2020, um, number C117, to limit or ban such products so we minimize the uh, plastic pollution and improve the environment for future generations. So starting tomorrow, so it is very timely that I'm here to 
today. Um, it prohibits uh, retail stores, which I'll just give a quick overview. That would be grocery stores, convenience stores, liquor stores, etc., and food service businesses from selling or providing single-use plastic carryout bags. It prohibits uh, retail stores and food service businesses from selling or offering for sale any polystyrene foam food service products, so the styrofoam. It also prohibits all food service businesses from selling or providing any food served in the, foam, the styrofoam uh, packaging. It will permit single-use paper carryout bags with or without handles, um, except for grocery stores larger than 2,500 square feet. So you may see some of those um, from pharmacies and things like that. There are exemptions um, for certain types of single-use plastic bags, such as newspapers, sliced uh, deli products, fish, vegetables, dry cleaning. You'll still see those available. There are also exemptions for certain styrofoam packaging um, until May of 2024. So you might still see out two ounce single serve um, containers um, and anything maybe that's pre-packaged that the store is buying from the seller that already comes with the styrofoam um, container. Any business that feels that um, they are unable to find a, a commercially available or a feasibly available polystyrene foam food first service product, they can apply for a waiver for a one year um, deferral for that. So there is information online. Um, that also includes if uh, the business or person generates less than 500,000 in gross annual income, they cannot find an alternative product. They, they can apply for that waiver. Um, food banks as well are being granted a six month extension. They're still permitted to use single use plastic bags. Um, and then in November, um, November 4th of 2020, just they'll be asked to apply as well. We've been proactive. Uh, the health department has been proactive in getting information out to establishments that we um, do inspections for that are required to have the health department inspections, such as retail food, convenience stores, um, retail stores that might have prepackaged products, grocery stores, school stores. We sent a letter to about 1,500 establishments, and it's the packet that was provided to you. It has an overview in a letter, basic overview of the law, and um, the resources that are available from DEP and from the New Jersey Business Action Center. So we included those handouts um, that are easy to see so that they can answer some questions. In addition, our public health educator has been out at community events. She's been handing out the reusable bag provided to us by the ACUA. Um, you might have heard of the Bag Up campaign. Bag Up campaign. Um, that's the New Jersey Clean Communities um, Council's outreach program and they were the ones tasked with alerting the public about the upcoming fall. DEP um, was tasked with assisting businesses with compliance and they do have a very good website, it's easy to navigate, you can click on your type of establishment and it gives you an overview of what the requirements will be for your establishment. So the next steps for the <coughs> health department are we are required to complete 50 inspections between May 4th and June 30th. 25 of them need to be grocery stores, and 25 need to be food, food service establishments. We're looking at those inspections as a way to provide some education. Um, so our first round of inspections will be education, and we'll continue that as long as possible, because we know there's quite a learning curve with this. It's a big change in behavior. I know we've been hearing about it, but behavior doesn't really change until you're late to make the change, right? Um, we received some guidance from uh, New Jersey DEP that indicated you know, when we're providing a first offense, after we've done our education period, um, we're to provide 30 days for compliance, as well as we're allowed to ask for a reasonable extension. And say they're looking, waiting for a product to be delivered and it hasn't been received yet. So they're giving us, as the enforcement agency, uh, the ability to do that. Um, and we're waiting for further guidance from DEP on how to navigate, you know, inspections moving forward. And we'll be given that guidance in time. So, do you have any questions? Thank you, you said that there's an education period you alluded to the length of time. Is there a specific length of time that an education period will take place before we start to enforce it and it becomes punitive? Well, we're waiting for a little bit more guidance from the EP on that. We're looking at our first encounters with businesses as being an education period. Um, so, you know, the law does go into effect tomorrow. 
we're taking the stance of education for a first visit. Mm -hmm. Great presentation, thank you. Um, just, just one. I, I don't know if you said it, but uh, I know several businesses and even um, charitable organizations who do like food-related um, fundraising um, that have like stockpiles of styrofoam. Are they allowed to use it until it runs out, or are they? Well. The question we wasn't about this. We go with the trash uh, anyway. Uh, right. <laughs> we were talking about this with some other um, establish establishments as well. So Kathy Neisel is our environmental health coordinator for the environmental unit. Basically, you're not allowed to use it or sell it. But I had a call today from a church organization. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. And I said, look, I said, if we are doing the educational thing here, your event is Friday night, so they're lucky it's close. Mm -hmm. So, but we're going to come across this when we go out to the um, firefighters, chicken dinners, and yeah. stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me, it's my allergies. Um, we're not coming out there to put the hammer down these folks. They're still recovering from COVID. Yeah. And then it's just, we are taking the stance of being educational, okay. as is the DEP. Okay, great. But DEP, we have to do 15 inspections. Yeah. And I just have to document to them how many grocery stores, what ones we did, any violations found, yeah. and what we did, which educational, 30 day extension, anything like that. Great, I think that's an important point Absolutely. to have on the record, especially. Yes. Yep. Um, and then the other question I have um, is, have we seen any funding opportunities for the food bank specifically for the reusable bags? Because, I mean, like, or um, and my, my reason for asking that is, you know, if we need to encourage people to make donations to the food bank of those kind of things um, as another thing to consider, you know. Right. We're working closely with the Atlanta County Recycling Coordinator, Rebecca out of the ACUA, who is in turn working with the municipal recycling coordinators. Okay. So they're doing it, the recycling coordinators are basically going door to door within their towns. And their green teams are being really proactive with this. So I would suggest to any of the food banks to contact them in our counties. We're set up a little different than other counties. Okay. To contact them back over the ACUA. Okay. And I do not see, I just checked the website before I came down because we got some of the guidance just uh, this afternoon. But I did not see anything as far as um, any sort of financial assistance being offered at this time. No, they can get some, the, um, through the Clean Communities yeah. grant. They can, that's who's providing a lot of the money for the bags that BACA has gotten. Okay. And the towns are also, they can apply for that. And once we get to the stage where we have to do a fine, 70% of the fine money goes back to the food community. Okay, that's great. So it's kind of like a, a circle okay. to keep it going. All right, great. Thank you. So much. Mm -hmm. uh, just a comment. I think your presentation was wonderful. It's really good to see how proactive um, you and your departments are being, and we here in Atlanta County take our sensitive environment very seriously. And so I'm just really pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank you for the education aspect of this. But I actually have a couple of questions that are sort of connected to what um, Commissioner Gatto asked. Um, you said you sent out 1,300 letters. Is that, would that be, is that the normal amount that you'd send to these types of establishments? We said we have fit, approximately 1,500 what we call retail food establishments that we inspect. And that's who we sent these to. But that includes nursing homes that we do their kitchens, schools, the superintendents got the notice, because it also, the schools with the trays, the lunchtime and stuff. The problem with the schools is, I know in Jersey, there's a coalition that got together of the schools and they were applying for an extension. Because the problem is when the schools went from the trays, the plastic trays that you ran through the dishwasher, and went to the throwaway ones, they got rid of the dishwashers. <laughs> so now, now they're stuck. <coughs> so the school coalition, and I can't find out anywhere what schools in Lane County are part of this coalition to find out who's being proactive on that side for that extension. The, the reason I, I asked was because, I mean, one, I, I, I do do deliveries from the schools with mm -hmm. the, with the uh, everyone gets free lunch, free breakfast now. Yep. There's so much waste that they're, we're all donating to the food bank at Beacon, and we're using plastic bags now to deliver that. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, 
And the other reason I ask is because I, the, the health department's been so overwhelmed with, with COVID the last several years. I guess I was curious as to why did the state task the, our health department with this and not the ACUA? Because you said the fines would go back to the clean communities just operated through. What the state DEP did was the enforcement part can either be the municipal recycling coordinators or anybody who is under the CHOP grant, the County Environmental Health Act, okay. which is actually on the table for tonight. That's what we, we get money to do all of the environmental programs. It doesn't cover everything, but it's just a portion. Okay. And they attach this plastic bag ban to the CHOP grant. Okay, so we, they mandated that we have to do this. We had no choice. Uh, because believe that, me, we would have. Yeah, that's what I mean. Another yeah. follow-up is, is there donation? extra staff? Or there, what are the additional costs that are being required by this? Well, right now, because we have to do 50, our inspectors, our food inspectors, will be doing it while they're doing the regular inspection. So we broke it down, and each inspector is going to be doing it between four and six inspections. Which is the well, great. That safe. includes grocery stores. Okay, they're not just using one person. Correct. One person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but in Atlanta County, recycling enforcement, that's done through the ACUA. Right. Yeah, not us. That's right. I use the ACUA's reports and I see how great report. They're recycling inspections. But for some reason, the EP attaches to the C how great. That's what I was curious. You see yeah. kind of convoluted and I wasn't sure, you know, I, again, I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, Condemning the you know the, the need for this, it's just that like, again the state seems to be mandating it tell you how to do this without providing the funding to make sure it's, it's done the way we need it done, yeah. and the way we want it done. So. Yeah. so what we're suggesting, these folks like the food bags and stuff down the road, they may be able to get the biodegradable bags, and there are ones out there that are calling reusable. It's written right on there. It's a heavier grade plastic, a different type of plastic. And it's supposed to break down easier than what's being given out now. Shop yeah, they do put something in there as far as, you know, plant and corn based biodegradable bags. They define plastic. So I, as, as long as the packaging does say reusable, but also, you know, it's not this very technical term, a synthetic material made from linking monomers through a chemical reaction to create an organic polymer chain that can be molded or extruded at high heat into various solid forms, retaining their defined shape until the life cycle and after disposal. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure how What's your chemistry lesson for today? But, you know, for the example, it's very basic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so it's a yeah. huge adjustment time for us as consumers and for the retail world. You go to Cole's Christmas shopping, you better be bringing a big bag. Right. Because right. they can't give you a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and timing on this too, I mean our busy season yeah. uh, for the environmental health unit is summer. Yeah. So we've got ocean water, we have yeah, yeah, campgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll do our 50 and then we're kind of hoping that maybe there's a bit of a pause until the fall for us to be able to pick up again, but that will be our very busiest time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, once again, we thank your department. I mean, busy, busy, busy. But uh, your commitment to this is uh, outstanding. I appreciate the detail and, and your respect of everybody's individual situations. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, absolutely. We have a lot of conversation. Yeah. 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 In some special cases. And that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I heard you and uh, your colleague talked about educational Last week we had bring your children to work day, and one of the gentlemen in the office is such seven years old, really, <laughs> for plastic bags in the ocean, plastic cups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I tell you, this little seven-year-old kid, I felt he turned around and said, "The young lady, listen." I said, "Can somebody else take you down?" <laughs> he was so into it, seven years old, and he's so much older. So apparently. The message is getting out. When you have a seven-year-old kid sitting at your desk, and then he turns around and did his hands like this, and so, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because when you have kids that age, someone's teaching them about the environment and the plastic, and he talked about the turtles, and he was going and do this whole long spell. I couldn't even finish the conference, so I'm like, oh, I got to call y'all back. But he was very interested, 
Um, I'm gonna have to bring him over here. He's gonna leave the job for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> he might not take yours. We do have those summer internships. <laughs> <laughs> he might come over here for seven years old. But I, it, it's a amazing how the messages get out. Thank you. 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 Bond ordinance number two for the first year. Bond ordinance providing for various 2022 capital improvements and the acquisition of various capital equipment by and in the county of Atlantic, state of New Jersey, appropriating $25,632,000, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $24,349,000 bonds or notes to finance part of the cost thereof, first reading. Motion made the second. Any comments or questions? Seeing, hearing none, we'll have a roll call. Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Bond ordinance number three. Bond ordinance providing for various capital improvements for fiscal year 2022 by and for the Atlantic Cape Community College, appropriating <coughs> 4 million eight hundred seven thousand. Therefore, and authorizing the issuance of 4,807,000 bonds or notes in the County of Atlantic, State of New Jersey, for financing such appropriation, the principal of and interest on the aggregate principal amount of which will be entitled to state aid pursuant to Chapter 12 of the Laws of New Jersey of 1971, first reading. Second. Question made. Second. Any comments? This is our kind of standard bonding for the CCC and, and capital and stuff in property improvements, building improvements, things like that, it's separate from the additional monies that we got under the, uh, under the, the grant name um, where we're, we're adding the esports and the cybersecurity um, building. It's separate, so to make sure people are aware of that investment. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Okay. Well, Dallas? Bertino? Yes. Horsey? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. That brings us to our capital ordinance. Capital ordinance number one for the first reading. Capital ordinance providing for various capital improvements, equipment, and furnishings in and for the County of Atlantic, State of New Jersey, and appropriating $4,708,166 from the capital improvement fund and or the capital surplus fund to pay for the cost thereof. First reading. Second. Second. Any comments? Okay, Ballas? Yes. Martino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion <coughs> carries. That brings us into ordinance number four for the final reading. Ordinance preventing the Atlantic County Department of Public Safety, Division of Adult Attention, Detention, to hire county correctional police officers on a temporary basis with conversion to permanent status upon completion of an appropriate full basic course for the correctional officers, and to permit the Atlantic County Sheriff to hire sheriff officers on a temporary basis, basis pursuant to Public Law 2021, Chapter 406, Final Reading. Motion. Second. Right, second. Any comments or questions? Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Horsey? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. That brings us into our grant with resolution 213. Grant application and acceptance from the New Jersey Governor's Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse for the Municipal Alliance for the Prevention of Drug and Alcohol Abuse. Youth Leadership Plan, amount not to exceed $40,617. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any comments or contributions? Seeing here, none. Anything from the public? Okay, well, I'm sorry. I just want to highlight um, that our staff um, applied for this. This was additional money that was available, mm -hmm. and they applied and were successful. So it's additional money getting distributed to our municipal alliances. I just want to uh, give thanks to the staff for taking that mission. Any other 
Okay, I think we're out of roll call. Ballas? Yes. Rutino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 214. Grant application and acceptance from the New Jersey Department of Health for the TANIC facilities registration and inspection project. Amount not to exceed $3,000. Motion made second. Any comments or the Hearing none, anything from the public? Okay, we have a roll call. Ballas? Yes. Martino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Barker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 350. Grant acceptance from the New Jersey Department of Children and Families for the continued operation of the Atlantic County Family Success Centers, amount not to exceed $924,559. Question made second. Any comments from commissioners? Seeing here, none. Okay, well, we'll <coughs> Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Dave? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 216. Grant application and acceptance from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection for the 2022 County Environmental Health Act grant, amount not to exceed $235,087. So moved. Motion made second. Any comments or questions for the commissioners? Seeing here, none. Nothing from the public. Okay, we'll have a roll call. Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 217. Grant application to the New Jersey Division of Highway Traffic Safety for the alcohol and impaired driving, driving while intoxicated, and traffic enforcement and education program. Amount not to exceed forty-five thousand dollars. Second. Motion made second. Any comments or questions? Seeing here, none. Anything from the public? Okay, we'll Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution two eighteen. Grant application and acceptance from the Schools and Libraries Corporation for the Emergency Connectivity Fund grant to provide broadband internet service and equipment to support remote learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Amount not to exceed $9,126.60. Motion. Motion made second. Any comments from commissioners? Seeing here, none. Anything from the public? Okay. Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Orsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. That puts us to our competitive contracts with resolution 219. Amending resolution number 39, adopted February 1, 2022, competitive contracts for home care services mm. under the Division of Welfare and Statewide Respite well, Grant Programs mm. to add I Care Home Health Care and prefer Preferred Care at AppSeekin as additional providers. No additional costs. Second. Motion made second. Any comments from the commission? Seeing hearing none, it's public. Okay, we'll have roll call. Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're going to do our big contract with Resolution 220. Big contract with Arthur R. Henry Incorporated to provide the signalization of the intersection of Pomona Road, County Route 575, and Vera King Ferris Drive in the Township of Galloway. Amount not to exceed $1,327,587.07. Motion made second. Second. Motion made second. Any comments? Um, uh, Jerry, I have actually three, three questions here. Um, is, is Stockton sharing in the cost of this? Yeah. Yes. That's what I was going to mention. Yeah. They are. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> I know they requested this. I just wanted to yeah. at least yeah. confirm. It. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess my second question then is, what um, does this include the, the repaid or the resurfacing of that section that was completed as well, or is that yes. a separate contract? And once you ask the question, John, John is on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then my third yeah. question is, I think I think I saw this, but yeah. they're going to um, be considered of, of the school, the traffic from Stockton and and the public schools, Pilgrim Academy as well, in that area. I'm not familiar with that. Okay. One of the things <laughs> one of one of the things we're do, we're doing with with the, with Stockton was is that we own the property directly across from from uh, where the lights going. Okay. We we own all that property. In order in order to do exits 41 or 44, we had to buy certain certain amount of properties. Okay. One of the things we 
we've been asked, and, uh, and, and John probably has a lot more information than I do, is the group, there's a bicycle group in, in Galloway and that wants to use that property and then they want to get from that property across to Jimmy Leeds Road. And so we've been working with, uh, with Stockton to see what we can do, how, how, to, how to navigate that through the light across the Stockton property and, and out onto Jimmy Leeds Road. So, but the, the other the question about the, the resurfacing of the other section. Of the it, it, John, do you hear the question? I, I think we're resurfacing. He's he's asking where where are we going yeah. to resurface in in this project? Huh? Yes, Commissioner. Um, this is going to resurface basically from the base of the uh, bridges at the Parkway, uh, at the entrance exit there, through the intersection, um, where it's it's a little rough and it goes for a, a while, not too long. There's another segment of the road that we are paving beyond that that was left out when Stockton originally was going to do additional parking areas further to the south on Pomona Road. So that will be part of it. It's already designed um, and it's engineering and will be hopefully in the next highway improvement program in 2023. But that piece was left out because Stockton was going to do uh, some of that paving as part of their original project. That project got knocked back uh, for lack of funding and for them to continue uh, this Vera King Paris and Pomona Road. Okay. So more of it will be paid. Uh, there will be still a segment between the end of this uh, intersection and further to the south. And I, I, I can't remember the name of that road, uh, but it's where the um, um, fields? The, uh, where the fields are, the is it Deer Street? Flyhouse is. What's that? I'm sorry. Is it, is it Deer Street by the fields? Deer Street. Deer Street. Deer Street. Yeah. No, we've already paved a portion of it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so there's, uh, it's uh, the uh, Mulch World, I think it's called. I couldn't right. remember right. the name. So there's a piece between Mulch World and this intersection that, that is not going to be completed as part of this. But uh, if you ask next time, I'll make sure that I have a, a map there, there for you. Okay. I'll send you. I'll send you. I'll send you that because they, they've given me that. We'll, we'll we'll send you the map to show you exactly where. I, I appreciate that. But the reason I asked you because every time we do the sections, I knew there was a reason for this. Yes, and, and right. The, 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 the rougher parts stand out more. Right. So you know everybody wants to know why do they skip that? Exactly. It's always right. a legitimate reason, but right. I can't answer them at yeah. the time. So well, right by the, as you go past, as you go past the fields. You can make a there, there is going north now. You make a, you can make a left in here. That piece in there is what John is saying that okay. the Stockton was supposed to do as part of some of the work that they were doing on the campus. They 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 didn't have the funding to do that. So we're moving along on our project and that's the way. All right. Thank you. Jerry, you'll include the other commissioners on this. Yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have any other questions or comments from <coughs> the public? Ballas? Yes. Rutino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Bring us to our change orders with resolution 221. Change order number one, contract with Ocean Construction Limited Liability Corporation to provide repointing and repawking of various rooms and tile repairs in shower areas at the Harbor Fields Detention Center. Net increase, $17,104. Second, any comments from the commissioners? Seeing, hearing none, anything from the public? Okay, we'll have a roll call. Ballas? Yes. Fortino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. And we'll go to our miscellaneous with uh, resolution 222. Interlocal Services Agreement with the Atlantic County Improvement Authority for the administration of the 2021 Community Development Block Grant and the 2021 Home Investment Partnership Program. Amount not to exceed $1,851,108. Thank you. Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Dorsey? Yes. Dave? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 223. 
alternate method contract with Initium Software's Limited Liability Corporation, doing business as MTS Software Solutions Incorporated, to provide maintenance service for the DocuWare <coughs> Imaging Proprietary <coughs> Software, amount not to exceed $40,907.45. Second. 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 Ballas, yes. Bertino, yes. Corsi, yes. Days, yes. Fitzpatrick, yes. Scatto, yes. Parker, yes. Risley, yes. and Kern. Yes, motion carried. Resolution 225. Resolution authorizing the transfer of three county owned vehicles to the borough of Vienna. First. Second. First made second. Any comments from the commissioners? Anything hearing on? Anything from the public? Ballas, yes. Bertino, yes. Corsi, yes. Days, yes. Fitzpatrick, yes. Scatto, yes. Parker, yes. Risley, yes. And Kern, yes. Motion carries. Resolution 226. Resolution adopting the Atlantic County Multi Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan update. Motion. Second. Motion second. Any comments? Motion. 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 Ballas, yes. Bertino, yes. Corsi, yes. Days, yes. Fitzpatrick, yes. Scatto, yes. Parker, yes. Risley, yes. And Kern, yes. Motion carries. Resolution 227. <coughs> Resolution accepting one congestion mitigation and air quality fiscal year 17 flex 5310 grant funded vehicle from the New Jersey Transit Corporation. Second. Motion remains seconded. Any Acceptance of deeds, easements from the various grant orders in accordance with Atlantic County planning standards. Motion. Second. Motion seconded. Any commissioner or comments? Hey, I think I'm Ballas. Yes. Bertino. Yes. Corsi. Yes. Days. Yes. Fitzpatrick. Yes. Gatto. Yes. Parker. Yes. Risley. Yes. And Kern. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to combine and adopt resolution numbers 229 to 236, uh, chapter 159. Motion second. Any comments from the commission? Being here, none. Anything from the public? Okay. Well, roll call. Ballas. Yes. Bertino. Yes. Corsi. Days. Yes. Fitzpatrick. Yes. Gatto. Yes. Parker. Yes. Risley. Yes. And Kern. Yes. Motion carried. And as we go into appointments, uh, I will entertain a motion to combine and adopt resolutions 237 to 242. Mm -hmm. okay. Motion made. Second. Any comments? From the Seeing, hearing none. Anything from the public? Uh, I just, uh, before the roll call, as always, I'd like to thank the people that are volunteering their time and dedication to these boards. Okay, we'll have a roll call. Ballas? Yes. Tortino? Yes. Morsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Yes. And Harry. Uh, roadway solicitations are on okay, the motion to combine and adopt numbers 243 to 246. Mm -hmm. Motion made and seconded. Any comments from the commission? Any pink color? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm roll call. Ballas? Yes. Bertino? Yes. Corsi? Yes. Days? Yes. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Gatto? Yes. Parker? Yes. Risley? Yes. And Kern? Yes. Motion carries. That's when that's our commission sponsored our resolution with resolution 247. Resolution urging Governor Murphy and the New Jersey State Department of Education to cease from implementing their sexuality education curriculum for grammar, elementary school children, and require that all local school boards have public meetings for public input on the sexuality education curriculum prior to implementation. Sponsor, James A. Cortina. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any comments? Thank you very much, ma'am.
Um, at the last count, at the last commissioner's meeting here, we were brought to the uh, board's attention that uh, some of the residents, mothers, fathers in the community were coming to me in my district, and they were indicating some concerns that they had with the implementation of some aspects of the curriculum of the state of New Jersey, uh, the rights, responsibility, respect curriculum that they were presenting. Uh, the biggest issue that they had with it, with it was that in the first and second grade level, and that's why I really alluded to that in the resolution today, and the language that was in it came right specifically from the lesson plans. Um, they had a concern that there was no opportunity for them at a local school board level to be able to have input and discuss this topic. And that was what their context is. Um, I did look and have reviewed, I mean, and it's lengthy, all the lesson plans for it. Uh, the only issue they had was they felt they didn't have that opportunity at a local school board level in a public area to discuss it openly. And I said, well, one of the things about government, and I think all of us um, can agree uh, that we sit in these positions, is that you really want to give the people in your community the opportunity to ask any questions they may have on policies that we're implementing, especially because it may impact them. Um, they reached out to me, and, and as I said earlier, and we discussed it, that seemed to be the crux of the major uh, issue that they had, that at the local school board level, publicly, they didn't get a chance to discuss it. <coughs> I had the opportunity last evening, I spoke with the representatives from the NJEA for over an hour. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, the context of the resolution. I discussed and I said, as I told you guys, and I'm telling you now, my intent isn't to get involved in school curriculum issues <coughs> or to go back and tell the state of New Jersey how it is they need to educate the kids. The intent of the resolution was very specific. And it's specific that in this particular issue, first and second graders, that these parents want the opportunity at the school board level to go back and discuss it at the school board level. And they didn't see a mechanism in the process that they can, that they felt that they could say. Now, of course, in, if you delve into this a little bit, and I know um, some of you have, uh, there are opt-out options. There are a variety of issues that uh, some parents that can take when it comes to curriculum that they have in the schools. Um, and I said to them, well, have that option to do that process I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know process district to district and that each one's treated the same I have no idea what they're doing in the individual school systems but I didn't see a problem I said that we could discuss and say hey look before that is implemented at least allow this local school boards and those members of the public that may have a concern in that first and second grade level I keep going back to that because I've had people reach out to me and tell me what they believe the context of my resolution is, that you're against this, and you're that. Where do you read that? That's why I was specific in the language, and I was specific that I took it from the curriculum that the state of New Jersey gave. Also, I want to make sure I let you guys know that the governor, of course, has gone out with this particular lesson plan, and he's asked the Department of Education to go back and review the entire process. So some of this stuff may be in the process of being changed, but I only can act on what I have today, and that's the information I have, and I appreciate the NJEA uh, folks last night talking to me about where we find common ground that they want to work on some other issues with us uh, with respect to this curriculum. So I thought that that was encouraging, but I still felt at this point, hey, if I didn't bring this discussion to the table, we wouldn't be having that discussion on where to proceed and how to adjust this so it works for the parents at the local school board level. It's not an issue I like to talk about here at the county level. I know it belongs back in the local school districts and with the Department of Education. But I'm not afraid to stand up and say, as we all are here at this board point, it's something that we believe may impact the kid adversely, that we're going to stand up. I always will. I'll stand up and give an opinion and say, hey, look, you need the opportunity to go back and look at this. Look at, at the local level and give those parents the opportunity to hear about it or at least discuss it. So that was the context for my presenting the uh, this resolution for this board to consider. It wasn't meant to be anything dubious, devious. I have no agenda. I have and I have a cousin that identifies as being gay. Just forget all that. And that's not what this uh, that's not what this resolution was about, and it's not what its intent is. 
and I wanted to be clear of that with the board members in case you have questions that you guys may want to have and ask about it. I'm here to answer any of them. Uh, but I'm very clear on my intent. I'm not an educator. I have children that are teachers. So I understand the criteria that they go through day in and day out. But I still, as I said, and from those moms and dads that ask me, we need a mechanism to discuss it, not be afraid to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other commissioner comments? Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, um, I guess speaking as an educator, someone who has served on um, curriculum teams for districts, I think I, I guess I'm a little bit more aware of the process, and I think the process is in place for it to be handled on a local level. So I, I, you know, I wasn't really sure. I did speak to Commissioner Arpentino about this. Um, it, it just seems like we're writing a resolution about a process that should already be in place. You know, when it comes to curriculum, curriculum is something that is always handled on a local level. Now you have state standards and the state handles the standard, but on the curriculum side of it, it's up to each individual um, school district to implement the curriculum based on the standards, you know? And so I, I think in talking about process, and just, and, and you know, Commissioner Bettino did speak up and say that he was um, not exactly clear about the process. And the governor's office is still thinking about some things, That's all right going some on. things, all, right. all that stuff going on. I think for our process sake, what I'd like to see happen is for us to consider this in subcommittee, in the Education and Schools Committee, and have the Education and Schools Committee look into this and reach out to maybe uh, Phil Gunther or some of the superintendents and speak to maybe the NJEA uh, the union and, and, and some educators to find out what the process actually is, what's going on, what's not going on, what the governor's office is working on, and that way we can have a clearer understanding of what it is we're voting on, you know, in terms of passing the resolution. So my recommendation is that we send this back to uh, subcommittee and education schools committee with some sort of timeline because we don't want this thing to extend. You know, nobody wants to see this thing go four or five, you know, six months. You know, maybe you put some stipulation that the education schools committee, which I'm, I'm on, I'm a member of, we convene and we look into this, and then we can come back and maybe look at the language of the resolution, and maybe see what maybe, because I think everyone agrees, uh, James, that this parents deserve a right at the school board, at the level. School board level to ask to, to, to have to say whatever they want about their, about their kids' curriculum, about what their, their kids being taught in school. I don't think anyone's arguing with that point. I just think we're again we're talking about process and with so much so many question marks about what's going on with the governor's office and what the process is and you know not knowing what, what's happening at Atlantic City School District versus that probably township school district, you know, it's just there's just too many gray unanswered questions, you know, at least for me as an educator to vote with a you know, with a clear conscience on this resolution tonight. So I think the proper process would be if we kick this back to education and schools committee. And had them, or had us, I guess I should say, Mr. Corsi, I don't know if I'm uh, misspeaking. I know you're the chair of that committee, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Take a look at this a little bit further, maybe come back at the next meeting with the resolution that we all can kind of agree on that this is what's happening and where we would like to see things move forward. You have to make a motion. Yeah, first of all, let's just come. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. First of all, I, I understand you. That's the intent. Um, so I wouldn't be clear about the intent because that's why I didn't want this to develop off into 20 different kind of conversations. They're not the intent of the resolution. It was very pointed. It was those particular issues at the first and second grade level. I've explained that we had a discussion with the NGO people last night. It's not about the general conversation. I see the curriculum. Nobody's worried about bullying. No, all that stuff that they have in that general curriculum, no, that's fine. These were the issues that those parents raised because they didn't feel like at the local school board level they had that opportunity to go and discuss it at an open forum. There was no mechanism in place. And that's the thing I think if you're going to review in committee, you want to look at that because I'll be looking for that. What is it that we have in place that works at the state level that's going to allow them that mechanism to have that discussion? I never run, and I none of us here ever run from having the public asking us a question. They may not always agree with our decision. But they have the right to ask and we have the right to respond to them. If, uh, tell them what we know, because a lot of times we have information they may not know. Same as you're speaking to, Commissioner, that 
the education side, I'm not going to be specifically clear on all of it. You may have more that you want to add to it. I'm fine with you guys if you want to review it. But don't let it die and don't let it delve out of the content of whatever, what I'm proposing. I didn't look at you was going to take over my conversation. The first comment that was that I said, I understand your intent, but then you just took over. Yeah, so you didn't know what, you know what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would agree, uh, first of all, uh, it did not come to committee, and I think it should go to committee. I think that's a good opportunity. The second thing is, is that I think um, we do need to hear back from superintendents. Um, around the county. Um, get some feedback. I mean, it's not, I don't know, sometimes it's the intent or it's the spirit of the resolution or the intent of the resolution. So, so what happens is, I, you know, it's, it's the old saying is, is it politics or not politics? And this had really has nothing to do with politics. It really has to do, as you indicated from the beginning, but I think it needs to be more dialogue in terms of getting more additional information. And I would agree. We don't know what the hell the front office that they can say is doing reviewing it, who's reviewing it, can we get a representative from the Department of um, uh, Education, you know, the Acting Commissioner, someone to talk to us on the conference call will come down, we'll go up. I, I didn't think we can get it done. Um, we might be shortchanging ourselves to talk about bringing it to the next meeting. So I, I would like to consider, uh, or recommend that at least two meetings out. I, I would agree, don't let it die, whether it's up or down. Um, but I think it's, it's a good, um, benchmark to start and to get a good conversation to find out what's going on. I have not talked to the NJEA. I don't know what their positions are on it, uh, but it didn't come to committee. I don't agree. A lot of stuff we had talked about in dialogue last night, and I think we and talked about said, the said, you meet some common grounds. I mean, that's agreed. all good stuff. They understood all that. So I think what we need to do is, uh, I would agree, we, we, we pull it, uh, the table and table table review it, and review it in committee. Mm -hmm. But that's, if I made, made the motion, I'm just, uh, yeah. I, I, I make a motion. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Madam Clerk, it's at, at your discretion. It, it might be for the, the public an opportunity to comment on it, even though you didn't vote on it. The substance of the resolution itself, but as you're going to throw it into a committee, you might want to hear from them now. I'm, I'm suspecting some people might hear, given it's on the agenda. Just my thoughts. For this resolution. Do you have any comments on this Barbara Rowe, R H E A U L T, uh, Mulligan Township, 2554 Fifth Avenue. Um, I am here as uh, president of the Atlantic County Council of Education Associations, um, uh, the county affiliate of uh, NJEA. Um, why I came, and Commissioner, I spoke with Commissioner Bertina last night about this resolution. Um, so, to state, like, it, our concerns um, that um, there is no standalone sexuality curriculum for grammar and elementary schools. Mm -hmm. There are state standards embedded in the state standards, so sending some type of resolution urging Governor Murphy and the State Department of Education, uh, State Department of Education, to cease from implementing a curriculum, they don't have control over implementing curriculum. It, curriculum is implemented at the local level and all parents have that ability to speak on curriculum at their local school district level and that's where superintendents always welcome public comment public input contacting the superintendent's office um, in order to be able to have these discussions these discussions that parents have a right to ask questions and then to ask what's happening directly in the classroom. The, the governor and the Department of Education implemented the standards, and they're not new standards, they were revised in 2020. Uh, and when you have standards um, that are um, being reviewed, which happens periodically, there's a schedule of when all of the standards, math, ELA, health and phys ed, the arts, they all go through a regular revision every, um, every several years. The, the way that, to be able to explain what standards are and then where curriculum falls, picture a house. Picture a house where the foundation is the standards. The foundation are the standards, I should say. And the standards are just a framework that a house is built on. The standards then have a mission and a vision. The mission, in the case of the health and physical education standards, the mission is that all students will acquire the knowledge and skills of what is most essential to become individuals who possess health and physical literacy and pursue a life of wellness by developing the habits necessary to live healthy, productive lives that positively impact their families, schools, and community. And the vision is a quality, comprehensive health and phys ed program um, that fosters, and it's the basic core concepts, the core uh, ideas. And it's not just sex social and sexual, um, uh, social and sexual um, uh, core ideas. There are other, there are other things, drug and alcohol addiction, pregnancy, what, there's a complete list, physical fitness, mental health. The governor and the Department of Education have these standards put in place, and then the school districts are responsible for then implementing a curriculum based on that foundation and the vision and the mission. And I'm sorry, I know that I have three minutes, but I don't know if there's anybody else that would be qualified to be able to present this. So mm -hmm. I ask, I ask Madam Chair for an extension of my time. Thank you. Um, with that said, we build this foundation, and schools take a look at then. Once the standards are revised, schools do take an opportunity to look at the curriculum. They go through an extensive and rigorous process. It starts out with your curriculum supervisor and the teachers who are involved in that in that matter of the curriculum. I know Mr. Parker has been on curriculum committees. I've served on them, and any other educators can say we. I've written an entire science curriculum for a district from pre-K to 
to 12. Mm -hmm. It's comprehensive. And when the curriculum is written, it's based on appropriate age progressions. Mm -hmm. And what are the core concepts that students are supposed to know at about second grade? In the case of health and phys ed, it's at the end of second grade, at the end of fifth grade, at the end of eighth grade, at the end of 12th grade. And these core ideas then progress. So we're not teaching children anything that would be inappropriate. Our lesson plans are based on the curriculum that's been adopted at the Board of Education level. And the board, after they hear, the, hear what the revised curriculum is that's proposed by the curriculum supervisor and then the staff that are responsible for that, they take it to the school board subcommittee on curriculum revision. And they go through and, and have presentations on what has been revised. For the most part, revisions really don't change a lot. It might be, you know, we might have, you know, some new concepts or ideas introduced, but pretty much it's just a revision to be based on what's currently happening in our world. The board has public hearings on, just like you would adopt a resolution, you'll have a first reading and then you'll have a second reading, the public comment, for all those times. The public has that. And this is where I know that I agreed with um, Commissioner Bertino that we need to be able to do a better job explaining to our parents that they do have a voice so that they can go to their local school board. And the first step isn't to just call the superintendent and demand a change, or it's not to send a letter to the governor that says you need to cease and desist because the governor has no control over over the local curriculum, they have only oversight of what the standards are that have been adopted by the state through the Department of Education. So it's a matter of like, are, are we saying, you know, is it, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, or the cart before the horse? This is where we would like to have that ability to be able through, um, through um, uh, uh, working with your subcommittee on being able to explain the process and then also to draft any type of resolution or statement, whatever it is that this board, this this agency decides to adopt, so that you have every every option, whatever. This isn't a union position. This is just sound educational practice, sound research-based practice, and then what we do in our schools. So I would, I, I as I said, I reached out to Commissioner Bertino when I was aware of this. Um, and I, I, I have reached out to different people, and I'll say I've reached out to uh, Commissioner Parker, I've reached out to uh, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Um, it's it's edu it, it, it sound to be able to network and have these conversations and work together rather than have some kind of <coughs> out, you know, public outcry or come out and speak. That's all that that's all yeah. that we've asked. Yeah, and I think that's the direction we're going in in all your comments. You know, thank you for being here and addressing those comments. I'm sure they'll take them into consideration as well. I mean, I'll be more than happy to go through the entire document <laughs> yeah. to be able to expand, you know, expand yeah. core ideas and yeah. core ideas and disciplinary practice and whatnot and, and to be able to explain it from a curriculum writing end, a local curriculum writing end. Thanks, sir. Thank if you. anybody has any other questions, um, I believe that you all kind of can figure out how to get in touch with them. <laughs> since, since I always have uh, been able to. Thank you so quiet for Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Creed Pogue, Estelle Manor. Um, Dr. Joseph Ricca. Superintendent uh, in progressively the larger school district since 2009. Uh, served on his county college board of trustees since 2011. Uh, was one of the last people appointed by Governor Christie to the state board of education and also happens to be a registered Republican. Uh, his statement in relation to this whole issue. You can't fact check fantasy. This is not a real thing. It's madness. Party can't supersede reality. And I think okay. in some cases, unfortunately, there's a temptation to sort of exit reality into an echo chamber 
we're all just yelling and screaming about things. The parents are concerned. Talk with your local superintendent. Talk with your school board. Talk with your child's teachers. The politicians know nothing about education. That last part was his words, not mine. <laughs> Except for two of them. <laughs> I, I would mention, obviously, there are three of you who had previous experience on a board of education. There are two of you who are educators, so obviously, no offense on this part. I've been on the board side too. I did. Okay. Then there's been four. Then, then the thing is, people have that knowledge of what actually is involved in writing curriculum. I would strongly ask that the committee not use this resolution as a baseline for anything, because with all respect, it is relatively fact-free. The state did not adopt curriculum. The state is not requesting curriculum. This is an organization called Advocates for Youth, not connected with the state. That lesson plan is being talked about was for, great, for ages 9 through 15. I think that's way too broad of a range for some of the things getting talked about, but I'm not an educator, Becky was, but she didn't teach that subject either. But the whole thing is, it's one thing to be involved with how the committee is talking about sexuality education, what's being done at the special services school, what's being done at ACIT, because that is actually under county control. But getting into the whole rest of it seems to go beyond that. Now whether, you know, during the committee you want to make arrangements for <coughs> the author to be, uh, to have one of the others substitute out, you know, that's up to you all how you want to do that. You know, you sound like, you sound like the 10th commission up here, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> I try to help you, Ernest, but it's okay. You, you, you know, we love each other. We're all good. But on a more serious matter, I don't know where I'm at on time, but um, we have seen way too many teenagers commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And some of that, you know, may come from drugs, opioids, etc. Some of it comes from maturity issues, sexuality, expressions, etc. And so, in all seriousness, the last thing you would want to have is a situation where the kids feel they have no place safe to talk about. If you think that they are not hearing about sex outside of school, then sorry you're naive. They are. School hopefully is where they can get better information and go from there. So I would, in fact, um, hope that the resolution, all respect, is discarded because it's just full of triggers and but you go from there with the subject. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Sue Swizetti and I live in Anchorage Township. Um, I am a retired teacher, so I don't have to be as PR as they are. <laughs> hey, uh -oh. Um, oh yeah, really. Um, okay, basic, okay, let me just read this off because I really did spend time on this. I'm retired. I get to spend time researching these things. The cur complete curriculum in question, the PE and health ed, the standard set forth is 66 pages. It's very comprehensive, as, as Ms. Rowe was saying. And it is designed so that, you know, grade three builds on what they learned by the time they got to second grade. Um, the curriculum should be followed as it is written, or standards will not be met by the time the students graduate. The, the lessons are age appropriate, and I do have, um, uh, for instance, family life, which is again where this this is the model curriculum. We have we have the standards, and then we have a model curriculum, which kind of gives you a little shove in the right direction as to where you want to how you want to teach this. Um, the family unit encompasses this is for grade two by grade two. Uh, the family unit encompasses the diversity of family forms in contemporary society. Gender-specific similarities and differences exist between males and females. Wow. Basically, it's only asking that you, you acknowledge that these people, that, that people are diverse and that we respect, okay? I read through the 66 pages of curriculum and the model curriculum that the state puts forth. 
to guide teachers, and there is no mention whatsoever in any of those 66 pages on anything on the DOE website about pink, blue, and purple, <coughs> which is the, the, prob the problem that your parents had there. I couldn't find this reference anywhere on the NJDOE website. I finally did find the quote, and it was in the New York Post article. <coughs> okay, uh, the county commissioner has requested that 66 pages of curriculum, or at least that's how it reads as far as I'm concerned for this resolution, that the 66 pages be done away with because there's four sentences in a program that may be used. This is not from the state. This is from a private company who's hoping to sell their product to the school systems to say, this is our easy way of covering all the bases on this standard. Use this. Okay? Um, I mean, like, like, the three R's that you reference is not a curriculum standard. It's a private company. Um, this proposed resolution, the way it reads, would be like getting rid of the K through 12 math curriculum entirely because you're offended by a picture on one of the third grade math books and one that has not been adopted by any of the school systems, has not been adopted by the state, has not been adopted by any district, and has not been adopted by any community. It's been thrown out there as a flashpoint from the likes of the New York Post to see what kind of what kind of issue they can make. Um, it is strictly your opinion that it's not age appropriate, although that again depends on whether you're talking about the state standards off of the DOE website, or if you're talking about this program that the three R's are promoting. Um, according to the 2019 report, the National Resource Center of Reaching Victims. From 2011 to 2015, one in five hate crime victims reported sexual orientation as the motive. And according to the Williams Institute UCLA School of Law Findings, 20% of LGBTQ students reported physical assault in the year prior to the report, and 84% of transgender students were bullied or harassed because of their gender identity. Okay. Um, you had said that this curriculum would do more harm than good. That's a lot of harm. That's a lot of harm that's already happening. You're seeing these kids getting hurt, hurting themselves, getting bullied, hating school because they don't want to show up. Um, and then uh, according to the Health and Human Service Governor website, Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972 prohibits sex, including pregnancy, so sexual orientation and gender identity, discrimination in any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Just to put that out there and say this is, this is something that you're going to have to contend with also. Um, how do we change this? According to the one resource that was linked on the DOE website, okay, um, schools saw their incidents of bullying and assault be cut in half with the introduction of supportive staff, genders and sexualities alliance clubs started by the students, and positive inclusion in curriculum. There's all sorts of, of evidence on that as well, and I think I have that over here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. If you have any information that you'd like the committee to review, please send it over. Um, I would, I would, um, Again, if you all of it's on DOE, okay. Um, don't start off the New York Post. Start with <laughs> DOE. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I'd like us to look at the bigger picture. Think about moving forward, right, Mr. I am in agreement that something is broken in the process, but not just in the process when it comes to these sexual education standards and the health standards, right? We need to look at why parents feel that they are not being heard or not having an opportunity for input. I'm a math teacher. Um, for years, ever since uh, about 2014 when the standards were changed, I've been screaming to anybody that will hear me that the math standards are inappropriate. I'm teaching abstract skills to kids that do not have abstract reasoning. 
accountability, right? So what I'd like to see coming out of this committee is that we start a conversation within our level and urge the state to look at ways that we can make sure parents know where curriculum meetings are, whether it be posted on the website, whether they be special meetings, like we have the budget meetings. The curriculum is just as important as the budget when it comes to school. The two go hand in hand. So we need to make these curriculum meetings as important and is recognized to the public so that they do have the opportunity for input. They do need to know when to go in. So when you're drafting your language, I urge you to remove that part about the sexual education. It's a hotbed topic right now. We all know what's going on in the nation and what other states are doing and what some sides are saying and what other sides are saying, right? Let's put ourselves above this fray and work towards what would be better for our constituents, our parents, and our children. Thank you. When I read this, I was immediately concerned, um, especially, specifically, the ceasing the implementation of this curriculum, this curriculum that was passed back in 2019. I am, you know, proudly a member of the Atlanta County community and a member of the gay community. And right now, you see, as it's been mentioned, what's happening across the nation: trans health care being denied to people disallowing schools from engaging in conversation about sexuality and gender, my community is living in survival mode right now. When things like this come up, we are immediately on alert. Because the next generation that's coming after us, we are trying so hard to make everything better for them. So that they don't have to live through the shadows and the stigma that comes from being a part of a community that has to hide. And we are unique in that we are a community that gets too high. And those social situations that evolve out of that um, can really have long-standing disastrous effects. As we mentioned, the um, suicidality of the LGBTQ community and the harassment that we face and everything. And this education standard that has been, that New Jersey is proposing or has standards for, um, you know, it's a massive step in the right direction because it's going to change the dynamic that people who are figuring themselves out through their K through 12 life are going to be interacting with, interfacing with. Their friends are going to understand what they are and how they identify in a way that they don't currently because, let me tell you, I graduated in 2009. My introduction to the LGBTQ community through my education system was, and gay people exist too. And that was it. So I just hope that as it's been mentioned this evening, that this gets completely redirected to the focus that it should be, which is that parents need to know how to interact with their school boards. Parents need to know how to communicate their concerns about anything, whether it's curriculum or whether it's extracurricular with their school boards. So that's all I really wanted to mention. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I'm Betsy Enbaugh. I live in Northfield. My kids attend Northfield schools. And I'm an associate professor of sociology at Stockton. And I've been working with schools in Atlanta County and throughout New Jersey to implement the LGBTQ inclusive curriculum over the last three years. Um, and I've provided some professional development sessions to schools around the state, uh, including in Atlanta County. 
And so I just wanted to share some of the basic things that I've learned working with New Jersey educators and communities and trying to implement these policies over the last few years. Several points uh, have already been made. Um, I appreciate that uh, Ms. Rutieri brought up adverse impact because um, the uh, one, one cl clarification I want to make is there are two separate policies. One relates to LGBTQ inclusive curriculum, which is about the social, political, and economic contributions of LGBTQ people. This policy that, that this uh, resolution is meant to address is about sexual health and physical health education for all students. It is not the same thing. It is not part of the same thing. Um, the LGBTQ inclusive curriculum was specifically passed and implemented in New Jersey multiple years ago. It's been in effect for <coughs> you know, multiple academic years already um, to address those adverse impacts and to close gaps in emotional and social health and well-being and mental health and reduce suicidality and the other effects that have already been mentioned. This change that's come, you know has been in, uh, was passed a couple of years ago, but is coming into effect this fall, and so is getting some new attention. Is essentially to bring uh, school board level curricula, which needs to be adapted to fit new you know the revised standards, into alignment with uh, current scientific evidence based understanding of sex and gender. Um, the law against discrimination in New Jersey has been lost since 2006, and in New Jersey, uh, that law specifically states that gender identity, gender expression, um, are grounds for protection, you know, for, for equal protection of your rights. And that's been in effect in all phases of public accommodation, including public schools, since 2006. Um, and since, well, before that point, uh, you know, that, that law responds to not just the adverse impacts for which there's been mountains of evidence, you know, that, that LGBTQ youth in particular face specific struggles, isolation, mental health challenges, um, and those things create specific barriers to learning, to their success in educational environments, to their ability to focus on what's going on, to, you know, focus on learning instead of avoiding using the bathroom and therefore not eating and drinking during the day, things like that. Um, but this sexuality health curriculum, these revised standards, are basically catching us up to scientific principles that have been agreed on for decades. Um, the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, I'm a sociologist, sociologist, all, you know, pretty much all of the mainstream scientific, medical, social scientific associations and professionals nationwide <coughs> agree that um, gender identity and expression take on a myriad of forms. We're used to being raised with this binary male-female system, but that is not actually scientifically correct, either physically or mentally, psychologically, or socially. Um, and so these new standards are basically just bringing um, the standards which help local school boards design and choose curriculum and lesson plans up to date with, with those scientific understandings. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the clarification about standards are at the state level, curriculum is locally chosen. There is no curriculum, and this has been a, a point of confusion, so I really appreciate this opportunity to anyone I can share this information with. There is no LGBTQ curriculum. There, that doesn't exist. There is no sexuality health ed curriculum. There's standards and there are sample lessons. And uh, nobody's required to use those, right? Each, each school district is specifically uh, given guidance to choose curriculum that's suitable for their community, their school system, their students, and to serve the best they need to the best they can the needs of their specific students in that community. Um, so these standards clarify and help educators do that better from my perspective as a social scientist and as someone who's been working alongside educators to implement these policies. And um, I'd be happy to answer questions now or any time. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a very good clarification. But appreciate your time. Is there anybody else? Okay. That concludes.
the written portion of our agenda and a report of the special committee to the board. Uh, just, just really quickly, just an update from the Lakeland GAN perspective. Um, we are continuing to move forward with um, not only the work we need needed to obligate the money for the federal funding that we received, um, and we have uh, we received a great update today from um, the Department of the Office. We have to get that on. Um, our team also provided an update in terms of uh, pushing along uh, permit approval and things like that. Um, the Lenape Dam Powerhouse uh, improvement uh, has gone out to bid, and it's expected to uh, be completed by May 10th, possibly May 20th, depending on the level of questions that come back. Um, but just things are continuing to move, uh, move well, and uh, Congressman Van Drew's office and our local uh, state legislators' offices are both helping us to expedite the uh, permitting, the state permitting that's required so that we can get, again, those funds obligated by September 30th. Um, so a lot of good work happening there. And then just also wanted to provide an update. Um, I had reached out to uh, Vanessa at the NJDOT <coughs> because it's spring 2022, and if anybody can remember um, the number of resolutions and letters we talked about with regard to Cologne Avenue and Route 30, um, and the traffic improvements there are needed from a safety perspective. Um, if you remember in 2020, they were happy to tell us that those improvements were going to happen in two years. Um, so uh, I had asked on the status of that, and um, we got a response that um, it's moving on time without delays. However, it's not the same schedule that they gave us previously. <laughs> So they previously told us complete RW uh, right of way requisition would happen in spring of 2022, advertised for construction late spring of 2022, award contract early summer 2022, construction start summer 2022, and they are looking to do advertisement in May, contract award in late June, July, and anticipate construction will begin in the fall. So. We will continue to keep the pressure on, um, but I just wanted to, to offer that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I recently attended the uh, Solid Waste Advisory Committee in the Scrap Industry recently uh, on April 19th. And, uh, Right there, we gave a presentation from the ACOA side uh, talking about the next few steps that they're going to do due diligence on. Because uh, they want to go out and uh, get some, to put together bid documents to go out and look at what it would cost with private haulers to haul the trash out of the ACOA recycling uh, and construction and demolition material. They're going to go out and get pricing on that to see what the private sector may, might do. Uh, He's also looking at uh, landfills around the surrounding counties uh, that may be able to take the material. Uh, I think he's doing like he has to, his due diligence in preparation for a few years down the road when the landfill will be at max capacity. So um, he needs to get some time as he's doing now to see what the private sector is going to come back. Um, the document that I think they were presenting uh, that they were talking about uh, is trying to do maybe possibly five-year agreements with, uh, with landfills and or the haulers and or whatever. But he has to get started in that process because as you guys know, uh, trash has gotten very complicated. As I've told people before, trash is going to get expensive. Um, you're, you know, it's, no, it, it's just the nature of the business. Uh, the fuel cost production, I don't have to tell you, everybody here is all the issues that are happening with it, along with every other business. So he did uh, discuss it with the board. So once he gets some information back, and they be able to uh, uh, ascertain if it's feasible, or they want it, they'll let us know, and he'll let us know. So that was presented to the board as well. Uh, there was one brief discussion on the uh, transfer station. <coughs> there was no change on that at the uh, SWAC committee level at the moment. So uh, that's all I have on the SWAC committee. If anybody has questions, last away. <laughs> Uh, do we have any other reports of special committee? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, 
see none. Uh, any unfinished business? So last meeting we, we talked and Jerry sent an update on uh, some of the projects we, we talked about, um, some safety issues. Um, but something that was brought up by Mr. Fitzpatrick where the um, gentleman was, was <coughs> struck by a vehicle and killed one of those streets out there with a bike path. Um, and looking at it, you know, possibly some, there's many streets that that bike path goes across, whether it's municipal or county. Um, one thing that we can possibly do in, in the immediate future is if you can have engineering look into <coughs> reducing the speed. Um, if that stretch of roadway from Shore Road to New Road um, is anything but residential um, and business, um, I'd be surprised. Um, you have housing complexes, multiple, multiple units, right. and the speed limit there, if you start basically at the bay, you know, you look at a 25, and when you get to Shore Road, the new road, it's 35 miles an hour, which should be 25. And then you cross over and get to um, the, the little bridge there where the marina is, and then right as you pass that, it picks up to 45. And then you get to, to um, Steelwheel Road, and then it picks up to 50. So there's there's so many different phases that that phase is in to reduce that speed in that stretch of roadway uh, where we have a bike path and where we have um, multiple residential units, um, I think would increase the safety of that stretch of roadway immensely. Um, and then, you know, in, in the future, whether there's, you know, a, a flashing beacon there, but, but again, once we, we get into that, then we're looking at beacons in, in all, the, all the county roads and we're pushing for municipal roads along these, these bike paths, which traverse multiple municipalities. So, just my thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, do we have any other unfinished business that we want to review? Madam Chair, um, I think it's hot off the press that the county um, was successful in the appeal of the pilot. Um, I think I just saw that come out this afternoon. It was this morning. Oh, this morning. Um, so I'm hoping in our next budget subcommittee meeting, Chair, we'll, we'll talk yeah, about that. And, uh, you know, what we're, what we're going to do with that and how that impacts the budget we just passed. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, just trying to get your attention. Oh, yes, sir. Actually, Maureen, it was a, uh, the I state filed a motion for re but. reconsideration, yeah. and uh, Judge Blee denied that for reasons which were, uh, he was very clear on in an 18-page opinion that he wrote. Um, the state, to my mind, and I said that, so I think when I reported before, I thought it was totally off base in the arguments that they made. That was manifest in the decision uh, that the judge issued. Uh, it wasn't buying their arguments at all that they didn't know um, what they were supposed to be arguing in court when they had the oral argument before Judge Marzak. I mean, the state really now should come to the table on this thing and look to resolve it for the benefit of the county and quit playing around, quit wasting everybody's time and money. We'll see if they do that. Uh, we're prepared if we don't hear from Judge Blee in the next couple of days as to, um, you know, what he intends to do uh, in terms of a me mechanism of moving forward. Because all we have right now, and I want to be very clear on this, everybody's talking about, well, you know, how's this going to affect the budget going forward? We may be a long way from that. Okay. All that's been determined at this point is the liability aspect of the case. The damages aspect is still to be determined, and that's the next phase that we hope we'll get into very, very quickly, and that hopefully that will um, convince the state to come to the table and look to resolve this. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. Madam Chair, will you agree with me if I may, just to uh, piggyback on the little bit of what uh, Commissioner Latino said. For anyone who's interested, tomorrow at the Atlantic County Parks and Environment Committee meeting, Rick Dolby will be giving a presentation about his plan that was referenced tonight as well in that meeting. So for anyone that missed the SWAC meeting, if you want to hear from Rick Dolby, he will be on the floor <coughs> primary tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. Any other unfinished business? Can I just make a comment? Um, to 
clarify, educate, and, and let us know exactly how the process works so that we can now go forward and make a proactive resolution if necessary that, that will put uh, the public's mind at ease knowing that they do have input into the curriculum that their children learn from in school. Thank you. Thank you. Any other unfinished business? Anybody have any new business? I have kind of new business that kind of blends into unfinished business. <laughs> we, we were at the, uh, the Southern New Jersey Commission meeting. Um, John and I mentioned that the 911 fees have been diverted by the state. Um, he's asked us to write a letter. I'd like to see that we, we do that. I, I looked, the last letter that I wrote was in uh, 2019 in April. I know this board has passed a resolution previously. The county has not received any of those 911 fees since 2009. That can be put towards our county radio system and our local you know, fire, fire <coughs> EMS dispatch. Um, so I'd like to see that the, the board, if, the, the, you know, if anybody is in this meeting, I have no problem doing it again, but I know NJAC has been pushing this. They, they've really stepped it up. And I would like to see the board send another letter uh, to our state um, representatives asking that the state stop diverting our 911 fees that we all fall peg and that we should be receiving. Thank you. Any other new business? Uh, just one more thing real quick. Um, just a reminder to the public uh, that may be here tonight and, and listening. Um, May 4th, 11 o'clock, is the dedication of the courts in Bay's Landing. Um, dedicating three quarters. That's correct. Three courtrooms um, to, you know, to the retired assignment judges and who's the third? Judge Herbert Jacobs. Herbert Jacobs. Uh, Judge Jacobs served back in, uh, I think he was appointed in 1964, and then he died very untimely, I believe it was in 1978. He was appointed to the bench, I believe, if uh, I have my facts correct, when he was 30 years old, uh, one of the youngest appointed judges in the entire state of New Jersey, and one of the first, maybe the first African American judge, certainly in, in this vistage, but they may be in the state of New Jersey. Uh, his son Joe Jacobs is going to be going to be there tomorrow with other family members. Uh, but uh, uh, Judge Mendez, uh, judge, who is the our most recent assignment judge, who uh, retired as of March one, and uh, Judge Valerie Armstrong, who was the uh, first uh, female assignment judge in this vicinage. Um, and uh, we got three really terrific honorees. I mean, they, they, are, they were exceptional jurists who did a lot uh, to advance uh, the cause of equal justice under the law uh, in, this, in this county. And that's the historic, historic courthouse that's, on Main Street. That's Bay correct. Bay, not the criminal courthouse. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have any other new business? Um, the news today uh, that was leaked from the Supreme Court that uh, Roe versus Wade is likely to be overturned. Um, I would like this board to create a resolution in support of, of that law, in support of Roe versus Wade. Is there any question? No, I think you have to. You're making a motion. Make sure that you know. Right. Well, how do we know that? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For next meeting. Yeah. Okay. You can talk privately, or if you want to talk to but you can come when you're good. Yeah. Thank you. Any other new business? Uh, well, I don't want to miss, uh, it's kind of written communications. I think you're all going to get uh, an email today at some point. Um, North Beach Mini Golf is having their grand opening in Atlantic City on Saturday at noon, ribbon cutting. Uh, everybody's invited. It's not, the weather's not looking too good, so I think it's brave and out there for these, uh, these young entrepreneurs in the city. Um, they, uh, we did support them. Uh, from the Improvement Authority perspective uh, to, to help them get this uh, venture off the ground. And I think it's uh, a really great new asset for the city right on the new uh, piece of the board. So I'm a little biased. They're friends of mine. 
um, and I did encourage them to invest in Atlantic City, so I want to see them being successful. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to come out Euclid Avenue and the boardwalk, um, go play some mini golf in Atlantic City. Okay. Do we have any other new business? Do we have any written communications or petitions that we would like to discuss? Okay. Seeing none, I uh, will now open. Uh, the public comments portion. Anyone that would like to speak during public comments, please come to the podium, state your name, and the uh, town that you reside. And again, we will have three minutes. Anybody? Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Curry. I reside in Galloway Township. Um, the thing I'm looking for is basically. I'm a retired county correctional police officer. And I guess you could say the COVID or a stipend fund that was issued to the officers at the jail. There was a thing that if you were in the military, if you went to another department, or if you were retiring, you didn't get that money during the pandemic period between March and June. I'm a retiree. My friend, Officer Doherty, who's here with me, is also a retiree. We have 25 officers who retired during that time, and they didn't get paid. I don't think it's fair. I think we should have got paid. We worked in the jail, we did our job, and especially me, I had to work video for it. I couldn't tell the judge, hey, listen, we can't bring nobody down due to the fact that we have a pandemic going on. We still had to run the courts. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm saying here. Now, hopefully, I can get something in clarification written saying, hey, this is why it happened, and I would appreciate the reference. I think um, Mr. Dorosso, did you want to give a written communication? Oh, I'll get his name in for, on an address and we'll, we'll send him something. I mean, I'm just telling the board there were 480 people that left county government during that time period. So quite, quite truthfully, 480 people, a little difficult to, and some of them passed away, some of them, you know, moved out of the state. So when we made the decision, you had to be on board at the time we made the decision for uh, for the uh, premium pay or hazardous pay that that you had to be on board at the time. That, that, that was it. I think one gentleman yeah. yes. so I think the gentleman is basically asking for some kind of response. Yes. Maybe like you said, as far as I think that's because the yeah. information so yeah. 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 on the same page. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. No, I was just going to say the same thing. I mean, I would, I would think you were, you're saying you worked it. I worked you worked during that time during period. that period of time. Right. So, and uh, now I will tell you this, uh, Chairman Bounds, Mr. Bounds, I was out for about three and a half weeks because I got sick, but I did come back and I did work the remaining period of the pandemic. And we had a lot of other officers who got sick, but they still got paid. But the ones that retiree. Um, we have what? 20, 25 of us. 26, 26 of us that retired. And some of them worked the whole pandemic, didn't go out nothing, and had to work overtime, and they didn't get paid for it. And we don't think it was fair for us. So, so Jerry, would you rather have um, the, their union head <coughs> give you a list of them officers instead no. of being contacted by no, all, I, all no, of them? I know, I know of 180 people that retire. I don't, I don't need that. I, I just need his name, and, and, and I'll get that from human resources and I'll respond appropriately. Okay. Uh, do we have anybody else from the public? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Any comments? I have a couple. I'm just going to say, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, that uh, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, as well as Brain Cancer Awareness Month. I'll be working with council on resolutions in support of these uh, very important issues. As you know, some of the numbers again, an estimated 700,000 people in the United States were living in a primary brain, living with a primary brain tumor, and approximately 88,974 will be diagnosed. Brain tumors can be deadly. They, like mental health illnesses, do not discriminate. Like the men, women, and children, and all races. Uh, one other uh, comment at the end, AA 
Go busy. Go busy. Go busy. Go busy. Uh, I attended that, and they are very excited about the National Convention coming to town. And uh, they said a lot of nice things about Sandy and, you know, you know, all the work that was done. There was quite a bit of work that was done to bring that to Atlantic City. So that will be uh, here in August, and it's nice to hear. No, that will be here in July. To July, sorry. 72 days from now. <laughs> 72 days from now. There's been a lot of planning, a lot of planning behind that, and quite a bit of room that is going into. We prepare a month and we prepare in advance and we don't really think it's soon. <laughs> uh, also, New Jersey Association of Counties will be hosting their annual convention this week in Atlantic City. Uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming the attendees and attending a variety of the workshops. Uh, anybody else for anything? Chair, I'd just like to say to our Muslim community, Eid Mubarak, we're having a Ramadan Mubarak as well, because we're ending Ramadan. And technically, yesterday was Eid, which is the festival celebration to, to kind of celebrate the end of Ramadan and fasting uh, season. But today, we actually had all school for Eid, even though yesterday was a holiday. So sometimes we can't time the day exactly right, but they do give us in our district the day off of school. So happy Eid and Eid to all the Muslims out there. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? Move to the order. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. <laughs> all right.